Hello everyone, welcome to Study IQ. Now next is Lord Amherst. Okay, Lord Amherst. And uh, the tenure is 9, 18, 23 to 18, 28. Now the only important event that happened during his time is Anglo-Burmese War in the year 1825-26. See, there were two Anglo-Burmese War between Burmese and English. There were uh, two wars. They fought twice. One during Lord Amherst time and after this you can see during Lord Dalhousie you can see the second Anglo-Burmese war and the second Anglo-Burmese war is important because they captured the lower part of Burma in the second uh, Anglo-Burmese war and they continued to rule from British India till 1935 okay so we will discuss all these things in the coming sessions anyway so just I want to tell you that uh, during Lord Amherst only this event this important and even within Anglo-Burmese war if you see the second Anglo-Burmese war is more important okay so there is nothing which can be asked from Lord Amherst as such okay next is one of the most important governor general Lord William Bentick the time is 1828 to 1835 one of the most important governor general so if you see some of the most important governor generals in history you will start with Lord Warren Hastings because he was the first Governor General of Bengal then Lord Cornwallis then you will talk about Lord Wellesley then Lord Minto because of Charter Act of 1813 then you will come to Lord William Bentick one of the most important Governor General a very liberal man who wanted to bring in some reforms and I will tell you what are the reforms that he brought okay and what are the we will and we will discuss what are the reforms that he introduced okay uh, one of the most important among that is uh, anti sadi resolution then we will see something like anti tugilo we will also discuss something on education right then if you go on you will see lord dalhousie lord canning lord dufferin right then you will go on and you finally you will end up with lord mountbatten okay so the most important reform that he introduced or the law that he passed is anti sadi resolution in the year 1829 okay so anti sadi resolution was passed in the year 1829 and what is sadi all of you know that okay where it was practiced it was practiced in north india not in south india and among the upper caste okay so sadi was practiced among upper caste in north india right now what is that a female was forced to commit suicide if her husband has died right so female was asked to jump onto the funeral pyre of the husband right and that's that's what the custom which was followed among the upper caste hindu people in north india okay so under anti sadi resolution sati was declared as culpable homicide not amounting to murder and the maximum punishment of 10 years of rigorous imprisonment was given for those who instigate or compel the female to commit suicide or those who force the female to jump onto the funeral pyre of the husband so anti sadi resolution was passed in 1829 okay so i hope you understood this sadi was declared as culpable homicide not amounting to murder and a maximum punishment of 10 years of rigorous in imprisonment was given for those who violate this law or for those who force the female to commit suicide okay now the when we discuss about 1857 revolt we will discuss about some socio-religious cause one of the most important socio-religious cause for 1857 revolt is this anti-sadi resolution because see uh, the upper caste hindu people started thinking that britishers are unnecessarily interfering in their religion so this was a practice which was followed from year long but now they abolished it they banned it they passed a law against it that means they are started they they started thinking that now the britishers are interfering in their religious matters okay so that is one of the social religious reason for 1857 revolt we'll come to that anyway the indian who actively supported to pass this resolution or the indian activist uh, who was uh, against sadi and whose effort culminated into the anti sadi resolution was Raja Ram Mohan Roy, right? Raja Ram Mohan Roy. Uh, Raja was a title given to him by Akbar II, okay? Not uh, he was a Raja of a particular country, no. Akbar II was given this title Raja. He is popularly known as father of modern India, okay? And in 2012 means there was a question, Lord Dalhousie in all probable cause could be called as father of modern India, okay? So now when we come to Dalhousie we will discuss many things we will discuss about railways we will discuss about post and telegraph we will discuss about hill stations we will discuss about doctrine of labs okay we will discuss about education woods dispatch 
we will discuss about PWD, Public Work Department, all those things were started during Dalhousie period. So, Dalhousie in fact could be called as father of modern India. Without Dalhousie or without the establishment of all those things, India would not have been like this, right? So, you should not tell that Dalhousie could be called as, a, Dalhousie is the father of modern India, Dalhousie can also be called as father of modern India, right? Because, Raja Ramon Roy is uh, known as father of modern India, okay? Now, why Akbar to gave this title to Raja Ramon Roy, the title Raja? See, actually he was sent to England by Akbar II and the purpose of that visit is basically to request to the Queen that uh, they should increase the pension of the Mughal kings, okay? So, for that purpose only he was sent to England and he, Raja Ramon Roy died in England in Bristol in the year 1833. See, we have a separate discussion on socio-religious reform movement or particularly 19th century socio-religious reform movement. There I will discuss in detail about Raja Ramon Roy because Raja Ramon Roy in itself is a chapter okay so, so on muslim side i'll discuss about sir said ahmed khan and on the hindu side i'll discuss about raja ram mohan roy two reformers so we will cover sir said ahmed khan and raja ram mohan roy under reformist movement then we have on the other side obviously revivalist movement on one side there will be hindus which is uh, swami dayanand saraswati which will be led by dayanand saraswati and on the other side you can see wahhabi movement from the Muslim side. So, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, we will cover in detail under reformist movement when we discuss about 19th century socio-religious reform movement. Okay. When we discuss about Lord William Bentick, this period is more important because there was a Charter Act 1833. Okay. Now, we have already seen a Charter Act of 1813 and two provisions we understood, right? So, the Charter Act of 1813 is important for two reasons. One is it it ended the monopoly of East India Company. Till then, East India Company used to enjoy the monopoly, right, in India, right. So, in 1813, with the Charter Act of 1813, monopoly of East India Company ended except in two items and we have seen that was trade in tea product and trade with China, right. And the second provision was the company was directed to spend rupees 1 lakh for the purpose of betterment of education in those areas where they have control. And that was their first effort towards education, right. Now, here let's see what is 1833 Charter Act. So, the first provision is the Governor General of Bengal became Governor General of India. The first and the most important one. See, earlier if you see what was the evolution, Governor of Bengal became Governor General of Bengal in 1773, right? And Warren Hastings was the first Governor General of Bengal. So, here the Governor General of Bengal post was abolished. Okay, and a new post was created, Governor General of India. Now, when I say Governor General of India, this person is going to be the superior of Governor of Madras and Governor of Bombay. Earlier, when we discussed about Governor General of Bengal, I told you the superiority is relative. When it comes to the internal matters, there is no superiority only in case of external matters. The Governor General of Bengal is superior, right? So here, in all sense, Governor General of India is person who is having complete authority or complete control over the governance in India, right? So who was the first Governor General of India? Lord William Bentick. So who was the last Governor General of Bengal? That is also Lord William Bentick because this post was abolished. Now, we have seen in 1773, the member of Executive Council was four. And because of some problems, we have seen in 1784, it was reduced to three. If you followed the lectures, you might have understood, right? It was reduced to three. Now, what happened is, in 1833, this number which was three now, which was once again increased to four. Now, again three plus one. That means, what was in 17, 1773, the same was the situation now. And the newly added member is known as law member. And his role is basically to advise the Governor General in the matters of law. So, he will take care of legal matters. Okay. So, 1833, till then it was 3. Because uh, from 1784 Pitts in the Act, it was reduced to 3 from 4. Right. Now, till 1833 it was 3. Now, it is increased to 4. And the newly added member is a law member. His role is basically to advise the Governor General in the matters of law. And the first law member was... Lord Macaulay. Lord Macaulay is very important because after some time we are going to discuss about Macaulay Minute. Some of the one of the most important reform in education. Okay. So I hope the two points are clear. Now the third provision, next provision is when we discussed about 1793 civil services was introduced. I told you a point that it was not through any open competitive exam. It was 
by selection right and indians were not allowed to enter into the civil services but now in 1833 there was a provision in this charter act that no discrimination should be made in the recruitment of civil services on the basis of color sex creed place of birth etc that means automatically now indians can also apply for the exam they can write the exam and they can clear the exam and they can enter into civil services so indians technically started entering into civil services from 1833 because of this charter act so charter act of 1833 is important from that point of view also indian started entering to civil services because now there is no discrimination on the basis of sex color creed place of birth etc so it was introduced in 17 so civil service was introduced in 1793 so after 40 years now indians can write civil service exam and they can enter into civil service exam but obviously the syllabus will be tough it will be designed for in their favor and the questions will also be set in their favor right exam will be conducted in england and everything will be in their favor but still some indians were able to crack this exam so technically speaking indian started entering into civil service from 1833 onwards because of this 1833 charter act now next provision if you see i have already told you right in 1793 lord cornwallis established four diwani courts in dhaka patna calcutta and murshidabad right now here there was a provision the four diwani courts which was established by lord cornwallis at dhaka patna calcutta and murshidabad were to be abolished and instead of that a high court has to be set up so the four diwani courts dhaka patna calcutta murshidabad were to be abolished and instead of that high courts to be set up and you will see high courts were set up in 1865 not in this region uh, but calcutta is there uh, not in dhaka patna calcutta murshidabad bombay calcutta madras right you will see the establishment of high court in 1865 we will come to that now so what are the three provisions that we have seen first is governor general of bengal became governor general of india the three executive members was increased to four fourth member is known as law member his role is basically to advise the governor general in the matters of law second we have seen there is a change in the so second is no discrimination should be made in the recruitment of civil services on the basis of sex color creed place of birth etc so indian started entering into civil services then we have seen the four diwani courts which were established by lord cornwallis at dhaka patna calcutta and murshidabad were to be abolished and instead high courts to be set up now one more point which is again very important that is an extension of 1813 charter act if you see in 1813 charter act first point is end of monopoly except in two items what are they trade in tea products and trade with china now this is a complete end of monopoly now that surviving monopoly that is trade in tea product and trade with china were also abolished that means any companies can come to india and establish trade with india no restrictions now okay complete end of monopoly so this led to complete deindustrialization the reason why we say deindustrialization we have discussed in 1813 so i hope you might have understood it completely so this deindustrialization is complete with 1833 charter act so if you see quickly what are the points governor general of bengal became governor general of india then we have seen the three members were increased to four member and the fourth member is known as a law member and his role is basically to advise the governor in the matter of law in legal matters then we have seen civil services not discrimination on the basis of sex color creed place of birth etc then we have seen the diwani courts which were established by lord cornwallis at dhaka patna calcutta and murshidabad were to be abolished and high courts to be set up then we have seen the two surviving monopoly also ended see if you know what we have discussed till now that is 1773 regulating act 1784 pits india act and 1813 charter act you can write it very easily okay it is actually a continuation of all the three how see if you see 1773 regulating act post of governor general of bengal was created you know that so here that is changed now 1784 pits india act if you know you know that four member was reduced to three now this three is again going to be changed to four so this is a change from 1784 pits india act okay so this is regulating act this is pits india act now if you know 1813 charter act okay so end of monopoly except in two items now there is a change that two surviving monopoly is also going to be ended so if you know this three act you can write the three provisions right now what about this two how will you write it you know the reforms introduced by cornwallis in 1793 right from that there is a change so if you see one reform is civil service reform so now i am talking about civil services 
no discrimination in the recruitment of civil services on the basis of sex, color, creed, place of birth, etc. Second, if you see judicial reform, then I told you he introduced four Diwani courts at Dhaka, Patna, Calcutta, Murshidabad. And now these four Diwani courts were to be abolished and instead high courts to be set up. So this is how you can remember 1833 Charter Act easily. So a quick recap again. First provision, Governor General of Bengal became Governor General of India. Three members till then became four members. Fourth member is a law member. His role is basically to advise the Governor General in matters of law. Okay. Now third is no discrimination should be made in the recruitment of civil services on the basis of sex, color, creed, place of birth, etc. Fourth is the four Diwani courts which were established by Lord Cornwallis were to be abolished and instead high courts to be set up. Fifth is the two surviving monopoly after 1813 Charter Act will also going to be ending now. Okay. Now the next point is anti tugi law. So we have already seen anti sadi resolution and we understood that sadi was declared as culpable homicide not amounting to murder and the instances of sadi was reduced after that right. Now this is something which is related to law and order okay. So if you get a question on law and order something like this the law and order situation in India has drastically improved during British time. Okay it's a general question. So if you get a statement something like this and if you need to generalize it or, or and if you need to write an answer on it, it can be comment, it can be discussed, it can be critically analyzed or whatever it is. So the first point that you need to start with is actually the police reforms which happened in 1793 under Lord Cornwallis, right? So we have discussed about Lord Cornwallis and we have discussed about the reforms introduced by Cornwallis and in 1793 we, we first started with we in fact started with police reforms, right? So after police reforms, Zamindars lost the power of policing. Till then they used to enjoy the power of policing. Then uh, police stations were established. Police officials were appointed. Now the police station is headed by Daroga. Number of stations form a circle and it will be headed by superintendent of police. All these things we discussed. So that should be your first point on your introduction. So when we are talking about any law and order related question, you should write about 1793 police reform first. Now another most important point you can write here is anti tugi law. See actually the law and order situation in India is drastically improved during British time. That's a fact. Okay. So these are some positives of uh, British rule in India. So we should understand British rule in India both in negative as well as positive terms. Right. See the developments which happened during Dalhousie time like introduction of railways. That was one of the positive right. The introduction of PWD department, post and telegraph, the anti sadi resolution various social reforms like uh, widow remarriage act right ban on human sacrifice ban on female infanticide then this anti tugi law anti sati resolution then we will see something related to education we have seen something in 1813 charter act then we are going to see maculae minute or we call it as trickle down theory or downward filtration theory then we will see woods dispatch which is understood as magna carta of modern indian education then we will see hunder commission report okay all these are the positives. So one of the positives again law and order situation has drastically improved. So if you get a question you should write this point. Okay. So now what is anti tugi law? Thugs were uh, a common problem in central part of India. Okay. So these people will hide in jungles and in the, in the forest regions. So the merchants uh, and the business people when they used to travel through this region these thugs who were hiding in the jungle they will attack these business people or the merchants with their team okay now these are armed people so they will attack and they will kill the merchants and they will loot whatever they have so this was a very difficult situation and uh, after the introduction of anti tugi law the situation has drastically improved under anti tugi law thugs were completely suppressed by the police okay so this is one of the most important point that you can write under law and order if you get a question on law and order situations otherwise you can write it if you get a question on lord william bentick what are the reforms introduced by lord william bentick you will write anti sadi resolution you will write anti tugi law you can also talk about 1833 charter act we have discussed something that now after this we will be talking about uh, something on education which is very important which we call it as trickle down theory or downward filtration theory okay so let's move on to that so we will discuss about education. Now we started with education in 1813 Charter Act itself right. Then I told you when the discussion is going on we will discuss about many milestones in education. So if you get a question in history or if you get a question in general you can bring in all these points because these are the milestones in education. Present day educational setup and system 
is basically evolved. Now, what is the evolution? Evolution is like this. We have already seen something happened in 1813. What was that? Under Charter Act, company was directed to spend rupees 1 lakh for the purpose of betterment of education in those areas where the British are having control, right? Then, next is going to happen in 1833. That is what we call as maculum minute or downward filtration theory or trickle-down theory. We'll discuss in detail now. Then after that, something will happen in 1837. So, the Persian will be replaced with English as the official language. That is one of the reasons for 1857 revolt also will come to that. Then we will see something on 1854. We call it as Woods Dispatch or the Magna Carta of Modern Indian Education. We'll come to that. Then we will discuss about 1882 Hundar Commission report. Now, like this, we have to discuss many milestones in the field of education. So, let's start with uh, 1833. What happened in 1833? What is that? Is basically Macaulay Minute. So, we are going to discuss about Macaulay Minute. Okay. See, in 1833, during this time, there was a debate which is going on, which is related to the education in India. Okay. So, there were two groups. One group, so the first group want to give education to Indians in Indian model and in Indian medium. Okay. So, basically, Indian model and Indian medium. Now, out of this, there is uh, two division. Now, out of this, there are two division. The first group will say, okay, Indian model, we agree with it, but the medium, okay, but the medium, it's like, it should be vernacular language. Okay. So, Indian model and vernacular. Now, the other group will agree with Indian model, but they are saying that it should be in the classical language, okay, like Sanskrit, etc., right? So, it should be in the classical language. So, classical language like uh, Sanskrit, Arabic, Persian, etc., okay? So, this is what one group. So, one group is ready to give Indian model of education either through classical language or through vernacular language. On the other side, they are saying it should be English model, and in English medium. Okay. Now, this group is known as Orientalist. Those who want to give education in Indian model, it can be either through vernacular language or classical language. This group is known as Anglicist. Okay. So, the debate is between Orientalist and Anglicist. What is the debate? Education in Indian model, education in English model, education in Indian language, education in or Indian model can be in classical language as well as vernacular language. Okay, English model and English medium. Now finally, Anglicist uh, won the debate. Okay, so they decided to give education in English model and English medium. So this decision was historic. Okay, now this is also called as Macular Minute. So, now they are going to give education to Indians in English model and in English medium. See, the problem with Indian education system till then is Indian system, we, we practice different systems, right? For Muslims, we have a Madrasa system and for Hindus, we have a Gurukul system. Both are not updated, okay? Both are outdated, right? See, if the Hindu system, if you see, it is not updated from uh, Gupta period onwards. Now, if you see Muslim system, when the Mughals came, they brought in a new system which was modern at that time, but it is not modern now. There are a lot of changes, so it was not updated. Okay, so both Muslim system and Hindu system had their problems. This is coming as a solution to it. English model and in English medium. Okay, modern education is going to be given to the Indians. Now, what is the problem here is they are not going to give education to all Indians. They are going to give education to a minority. Okay. That means hardly one percentage of the Indians are going to get education in English model and in English medium. And the assumption is that this one percentage of the Indians who is going to get the education in English model and in English medium will teach the others in vernacular language. This was an incorrect assumption which was made, right? So what happened is this one percentage of the Indians who got education in English model and in English medium was never ready to teach the rest of the 99 percentage of the Indians. That's why it is a failure. Now it is called as uh, it is called as trickle down theory. Trickle down theory means you throw something to the top, it will come down. So you educate one percentage of the Indians in English model and English medium. Automatically, this one percentage will educate the other Indians in the vernacular language. That is the assumption. That's why it is called as trickle down theory. Or it is also called as downward filtration theory. Okay. So if you get a question on Macaulay minute. If you get a question on trickle down theory or downward filtration theory, this is what you need to write. What is that? Indians are going to get education in English model and in English medium, but not all Indians 
a minority of Indians are going to get the education. That is, let's say one percentage of the Indians are going to get education in English model and in English medium. The assumption is these people will teach the others in vernacular language. But that assumption was not true and it will never become true. Now one more point is here they have given importance to higher education. Okay, so here you have given importance to higher education. So you will see in macula minute you are giving importance to higher education. That means higher education should be in English model and in English medium. Then if you see Woods Despatch that is coming in 1854 you will see they are giving importance to secondary education and in Hundar Commission you will see they are giving importance to primary education. So one of the other problem with this macula minute is actually you are giving importance to higher education. The root cause is not solving right. Primary education should be the problem with the primary education should be solved first. So instead of going from bottom to top they are actually coming from top to bottom. So this problem is completely solved in 1882 Hunter Commission report only so 50 years it is like this. They are giving importance to higher education and secondary education. Okay. So I hope all of you understood what is uh, this macula minute. So you are going to give education in English model and in English medium to the Indians. Minority of Indians or one percentage of Indians. The assumption is these one percentage of the Indians who got education in English model and in English medium will teach the others in vernacular language. It was not true. It will never become true. Okay. And then it is also called as trickle down theory. You can call it as downward filtration theory and this is what macula minute. I hope all of you understood this. So if I ask you why it was a failure, the reason why it was a failure is because the government did not took up the responsibility of giving education to masses and that responsibility was given to the one percentage of Indians who got education in English model and in English medium and that will never come true. And this problem is solved in 1854 Woods Despatch where the government took up the responsibility of giving education to masses. We will see that. We were actually talking about Lord William Bentick. So what all things we have discussed? We have discussed about anti-sati resolution in 1829, right? Then we have discussed about anti tugilo and we understood that uh, the problems of Tugs, how they solved it, right? Then we have discussed about Charter Act, Charter Act of uh, 1833, right? Then we have discussed about uh, Macula Minute or trickle down theory or downward filtration theory. Now, one more fact which I need to discuss is. In 1835, first medical college was set up at Calcutta and uh, the first, first tea garden was also set up. Okay, so first medical college and first tea garden was during the period of Lord William Bentick. So Lord William Bentick is one of the most important governor general. You need to know all these things in detail. Now next is uh, Charles Metcalf. Only for a few months in 1835 he came. So I already told you there is no fixed uh, period for governor general some will come for few months some will come for few years if you see Warren Hastings 1773 to 1785 12 years okay so like that there is no fixed tenure for governor generals now only one important thing which I need to discuss during his time was press freedom so press freedom was given so press freedom is very important uh, in history so some people will be giving it some people will be taking it back again some people will give it some people will take it back right press freedom was given for the first time by Charles Metcalf and that's why it is important okay so obviously we will see what is the first uh, newspaper which was published in India first Indian language newspaper etc we'll see okay after some time if you see in 1878 when we discuss about Lord Lytton we will tell that press freedom was taken away right so under vernacular press act so we will be discussing about vernacular press act then I'll tell you why the press freedom was taken away and how it was implemented okay and uh, how that resulted into the congress formation in 1885 also we will discuss and then if you see in 1880 lord ripon is coming and he will annul the vernacular press act so obviously press freedom was given again then you can see during the period of national emergency indira gandhi will also do the same thing press freedom will be taken away censorship was imposed on press then again it will be given so you can see press freedom it is highly volatile sometimes it will be given it will be taken back it will be given and taken back what is the first uh, newspaper published in india the bengal gazette in 1780 now the editor and owner is the editor and the owner for this uh, First newspaper, the Bengal Gazette is James Augustus Hickey. So obviously what is the first Indian language newspaper? That was Samvad Kaumudi. So it was in 1818. So who was the editor? Raja Ram Mohan Roy. Okay. In which language? So if you, if you are saying that it is an Indian language, which language? 
Bengali language. Okay, it was in Bengali language. So the first newspaper in India was the Bengal Gazette in 1780. James Augustus Hickey is the owner and the editor. First Indian language newspaper is Samvad Kaumudi in 1818. Rajaram Mohan Roy, which was in Bengali language. Now next is Lord Auckland. Okay, see uh, Auckland is a famous city in New Zealand. After some time, you will see Napier also. Napier is also a famous city. Okay, the time period is uh, 1836 and 42. This is the time period. Why this period is important is because the first Anglo Afghan War. You need to know why they are fighting against Afghanistan, Burma, or Bhutan, etc. Although, compared to India, they have limited population, no resource, nothing, but still they are fighting against these countries, right? They are fighting against Afghanistan. You can see twice they are fighting against Afghanistan. And just before I told you, Burmese war was fought. And the second is coming during Dalhousie time, right? So they are fighting against Burma. They are going to fight against Bhutan. Even after 1857, the Queen made a proclamation that you will not annex any states further or there is no further annexation. Still, they will fight against Bhutan. Not for the purpose of annexing Bhutan, but to keep these states as buffer states. Okay, see the objective of fighting wars against Afghan is to keep Afghanistan as a buffer state or Burma or Bhutan as a buffer state. Okay, because otherwise there is no need, they have no resources, very limited population. Britishers are not going to get any advantage because of this, right? See, if you have a control in Afghanistan, you can check any Russian invasion. Okay, similarly, if you have a control in Bhutan or Burma, you can check any invasion from Japan. So this is the purpose, this is the reason why they are fighting against Afghanistan on this side, Burma and Bhutan on this side. So Lord Auckland period is important, only one important event which I find is uh, no other events uh, you can find here with a possibility of getting a question in your exam. Now next is uh, Lord Ellenborough that is during 1842 and 44. Now one important thing which I need to discuss under Lord Ellenborough is actually annexation of Sindh which happened in 1843. See if you remember we have discussed about subsidiary alliance under Lord Wellesley. You should not have any confusion between subsidiary alliance and doctrine of lapse. Doctrine of lapse has happened under Dalhousie. So if you need to remember DD, doctrine of lapse and Dalhousie. Subsidiary alliance happened under Wellesley. So under subsidiary alliance, if you sign the treaty, the Britishers have to protect you. That is what the agreement, right? So if you are a, if you, if you, this is your territory, if this is your kingdom, you are signing the treaty means you are asking the Britishers to keep your army here and they will have to protect you from any external threats, right? So what happened was in most of the cases, it is not the external threat, threat, but the Britishers are the threat, right? And Britishers annex these states, right? So if you remember, in 1803, Sindh signed subsidiary alliance. So under subsidiary alliance, Britishers have to protect Sindh from any other states and any other invasion. And Britishers will not, Britishers should not interfere in the internal matters of Sindh. But on the contrary, what they did is they annexed Sindh. Okay, and there was a famous statement by Charles Napier and Charles Napier is the person who was responsible for annexation of Sindh. He have written, he wrote a letter to the Governor General by saying that we don't have any right to annex Sindh, but still we do that and what a piece of rascality it will be. So they actually know that they have no right to do it because Sindh is a state which signed the subsidiary alliance in 1803 and exactly after 40 years you are annexing Sindh. Now after some time, in 1856, I will discuss about one more important annexation that is Avadh. See, there are many other annexations also happening like Nagpur, Satara, Bhagat, etc. which was under doctrine of lapse. But in 1856, you can see one annexation which is annexation of Avadh. That is for an entirely different reason. They are saying misgovernance. Because Avadh you cannot annex under doctrine of lapse. Because it's a Muslim state, okay, Muslim kingdom. Wajid Ali Shah was the Nawab. So they, the, the adoption law or the doctrine of lapse is not applicable there. See, we will come to doctrine of lapse, then I will tell you in which states it is applicable, in which states it is not applicable. See, what you have learned is actually, if a king did not have a direct hire, that state will be annexed under British territory, right? But it is not true for all the cases. It is applicable to certain category of states only. We will come to that. So they cannot annex Avadh. So they found another reason, misgovernance, and they annexed Avadh. That was one of the most important reasons for 1857 revolt. And that is why Begum Hazrat Mahal was fighting actively in the 1857 revolt. We'll come to all these things in detail, okay? So now, Lord Ellenborough, annexation of Sindh, that's it.